boom, just like that. All right, so module two, developing ASP.NET MVC for models. That what we want to, uh, to discuss is the basic concept of an MVC model and take a look at how we're going to work with data. We'll talk a little bit of uh, code first and uh, entity framework. But let's start off by getting in and taking a look at our uh, model here. And here's what I want you to notice. John, I want you to look at that, uh, that little screen right there yeah. and, um, uh, and tell me, do you notice anything at all that's out of the ordinary? Is there anything on there that you haven't seen before in your life? Well, no, so that's, that's just a class. Like there's, we saw in the controller before that yep. that was at least had a, it, it you know, overrode something, had a base right. class. This is just a class. And that's exactly the point. That's all that this is, is it's just simply a class. That one of the big things when it comes to MVC that I always like to say is, is you know, don't overthink it. All that my model is, is it's just simply a class. This is just a, a very basic uh, photo class. You'll notice that it's got uh, an ID, it's got a title, um, it's even got a byte array uh, to store the actual uh, photo. Uh, it's got a, a date time, it's got a, a list of comments. At the end of the day, all that this is, is it's just simply a class, just like every other class that you've created throughout your entire development career. Mm -hmm. A model is a class. That's it. So, so looking at this class here, you've got, I mean, you've got a, uh, a virtual, so you can have, you know, they can link to each other, I guess, is yep. the way I say it. So one model can link to another. Yep. Um, you can have, you've got a byte array. You've got a date time. So it's just a class, but it can hold complex types. It can, all, all those sorts of things a class could do. Exactly. Right? Yep. Because okay. it's, it's a class. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's it. All right. Now, one of the big things that we want to try and do is centralize uh, as much code as possible. So that way, if we have to go in and make a change, which of course is inevitable, that we don't have to run around to 40 different spots and go in and start updating it. So if we can take that class that we had and start to provide a little bit of additional metadata, that's going to make our lives easier in the long run. And after mm -hmm. all, your number one job as a developer is to make your life as easy as possible. Yep. Now, uh, <laughs> what you're going to notice here um, is uh, what we've got on our uh, little photo class is that we've got a uh, display name of picture, and that's going to be used when we uh, set this up on a, uh, on a view. Uh, you're also going to notice that we're identifying the description as multi-line text. And you'll also notice with the create a date that we've gone so far as to not only tell it that it's going to be a date time and to tell it when it displays out that we want to give it a time title or a label of create a date, but we also have a display format for that as well. Mm -hmm. So that way every time that this is going to display out, in this case, it's going to be the day, month, year with the, uh, the two digit uh, year at the end. Yeah. So this is great because, um, first of all, it's a, it's a simple class, but this yep. allows you to kind of say some things about how that class works without writing a bunch of code, right? Exactly. And these are standard things. And what's nice with this is these, these annotations are your standard, um, sta a standard, uh, wh what do they call them, uh, component model data annotations. Yes. And what that means is that you could use these same annotated classes across anything else that understands Exactly. That, right? Yeah, this is not unique to uh, just MVC. Uh, and you'll also notice that there's a whole bunch of different uh, annotations as well. So you can identify what the data types are going to be. You can identify uh, as well the validation. Uh, so if something is required, you can just declare that out. Hey, this is required. And you'll even notice that you could provide an error message to go along with that. Uh, in the case of a number, uh, you could go ahead and give it a specific range. So that's going to obviously be 0 to 400 for the, uh, the height integer. Um, and then down towards the very bottom, you'll once again notice the required and, uh, and the data type. Now, uh, one little thing that I want to mention about the, uh, the data type real quickly here, you'll notice that it's data type um, email address. One of the great things with uh, MVC is it will generate that HTML5 for you. Uh, so when you go and you say, well, I want a text box for this email address, it's going to be input type equals email, which is going to instruct the browser to do the validation. And uh, for those of you that are using touch keyboards, if you've ever wondered why it is that you'll go to some web pages, tap in the spot where it says email address, 
and it will actually bring up the at sign and bring up the dot com on yep. your keyboard, yep. and other places don't. That's exactly what it is. That input type equals email. So if you tell uh, MVC, hey, this is an email address, MVC can help you. So basically, help MVC help <laughs> you. <laughs> right, right. And you know, that's, uh, I think a lot of people, when they saw that regular expression, they were maybe thinking, oh, I would use this to do email validation. Yep. And that is such a, a slippery slope, a, a sad <laughs> place to be where you're writing regular expressions for email addresses. So this is great. And this works, like you're saying, all the way to the AJAX validation and all yep. that kind of stuff. Can we cut over to my screen real quick? I, OK, so what I did is I went on, on Bing, and I'm, I went to data type attribute. And, and this is great, because this is showing me actually this. In, you know, It already shows me some information about it. But if you want to know more about these, you can type something like data type, email address, MSDN. And then this will bring you, as I'm clicking through, this brings you to MSDN. And you can see there's all kinds of annotations you can use. So the reason I'm pointing this out is to, to give an idea you know, where you can find more of these. Uh, and find more information about these. So like email address attribute, um, you know, you can just look at the whole list, min length, max length, and all that kind of stuff. Exactly, yeah. So if, right. the, if the string has to be a particular length, if you only want so many characters inside of there, very easy to go in and do that. Yeah, and yeah. The, the reason I, I wanted to show that is we don't have time to dig into all of these today. No. Uh, so I want to show you where you can go to learn more and learn more about how they work. Absolutely. Great. Now, one of the last things that uh, I want to mention, and then we'll go ahead and, and again, start digging into, uh, into some code here, yeah. um, is the, the whole goal of our controller is to, as we saw in that, that lovely little animation, mm -hmm. um, is to take uh, a request from the user and do some stuff behind the scenes. Now, the problem that we're going to have is how do we actually get that information in from the user? Because there's so many different ways that information could be passed back, that it could be inside the route data, it could be inside the query string, it could be inside the form. And on top of that, I've got much better things to do with my time than to have to read through all of the different fields inside of a form, recreate the object, and then start using it. Right. So the example here, if you're used to web forms, would be yeah. you've got you've got a page with a bunch of text box text boxes on it yep. right and then you've got to write that horrible code that says you know person dot first name equals text box first name dot text exactly this dot this equals that dot that and you've got to do all the validation right yep. you got to make sure all everything that they sent in is the right thing and the right type and the, all that crazy stuff right yep so MVC's got a simpler way of doing that. That's what you're telling me. That's exactly what I'm telling I'm you. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what our model binders are uh, are all about. Uh, that again, you know, you're going to notice I'm going to be a broken record. You're going to be a broken record yeah. throughout. Again, you're creating classes, you're creating methods, you're doing things that you've done for years. So our controllers and our actions are nothing but just simply classes and methods. So when I want to accept a bit of input from a user, all that I have to do is just pass that in at, or set that up as a parameter. And my binder will then look at my form, analyze my form, and based on the built-in logic that it has, it will generally figure out how to take this form field, put this into this property, take this form field, put this into this property, and then just give me the object. So in, uh, in a little while, we're going to go in and start setting up a very basic little just conference demo where we'll create a session object, we'll create a, uh, a speaker object. And you'll notice uh, when we set up our create that I'm just simply going to say, hey, give me a speaker, give me a session, and inside my controller action, I'll be able to just deal with it like the normal object and let the binder do its thing, that once we get into that action, I'm now going to already have that session object. I don't have to worry about reading the information out of the form. So, so if you're worried, if there's a lot of information coming at you, yep. the whole idea of model binders sounds a little scary, sounds a little like something crazy is happening. <laughs> what's, what's, what's nice is form comes in, your controller action has data. It just yep. can start working with data, and you don't have to do all the mapping because the, the idea is, following these conventions, the MVC created that form for you. It knows where it put all the stuff. So when yep. the form's submitted, it knows how to read it right back out. That's yep. the whole idea. So there's, like anything in MVC, mm -hmm. um, there's this default model binder that does that for you. Yep. You can override it. You can yep. change it all you want. But it's there for you. The simple, just like routing, the in-the-box one works most of the time. Exactly, exactly. Yep. So let's actually get in and, uh, and take a look at uh, creating a model here. 
Let me just kick out of the slide and go find my Visual Studio. Okay, we want to kick over to my desktop here. Yep. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and create a uh, brand new project here. And let's just give that. You got to stop oh, your PowerPoint. Um, yep. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Moving your hands makes yeah. it go faster. Oh, spaghetti! <laughs> Pause. <laughs> <laughs> One up. <laughs> if you could leave that there, that, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> they can't get we're, any better. We're, 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 we're getting punchy here. Yeah. And we're done. <laughs> we're out. <laughs> just pull a George Costanza. Just walk away now. Um, all right. And, 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 um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, um, uh, a conference uh, application here. Let me get uh, Zoom it up and running. There we go. Hit OK. Perfect. So uh, what I want you to notice is um, I'm just going with the, uh, with the defaults there. So my MVC4 app up top and just creating my uh, little conference. So again, mm -hmm. no real magic there. Um, I'm going to hit uh, OK, and I'm going to go ahead and use the uh, internet application, uh, mostly just because I want something that's going to be slightly gussier than the uh, white screen right, and black right. text, you know? <laughs> from my spaghetti application. Exactly, from your spaghetti <laughs> application. There. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and just uh, use that. Now, but it did the, work. It did so, work. So there's yep, that. Okay, exactly. Go ahead. Hey, and you know what? At the end of the day, that's, that's, that's all that ever matters. It worked. Um, now, on the internet application, one of the things that you're going to notice is that this is going to set up a lot of plumbing behind the scenes. So it's actually going to create uh, certain things for membership, like our, our login screen, our create account screen, and so forth. All of that's going to be there. Um, we're not going to be digging a whole lot into that, but you are going to notice there's going to be a lot of, of extra stuff in there. Uh, you'll also notice that this is going to create a, uh, a template uh, for us for all of our uh, pages uh, that it's going to, uh, to use. Again, you know, that's just one of those things that you could also go in and customize so inside that's, of MVC. That's the, if you're used to like a master page, right? That's exactly. the layout that yep. makes your page not look horrible. Exactly, right? yeah. Okay. I always like to give the, uh, the analogy of a jello mold. Yeah. You know, it's your yeah. jello mold. Perfect. You know? So, um, all right. So what I want to do right away is just uh, fire this page up. I haven't done anything. So just a real quick control F5. And you're going to notice as promised here that there is the uh, template that that we've now used, that we've now set up. Um, it's got the uh, the couple of uh, links to the couple of pages that uh, that it's created, and as promised, you'll also notice that we've got the uh, the register screen. Mm -hmm. Wait for that to come up for a second, and you'll also notice that we've got the uh, the login screen. So again, all of that was just set up by uh, by the template, and the whole goal of the templates, as with well all templates, is just to try and make your life uh, easier. There's no sense in going in and reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. There's a friend of mine that likes to say, "We're not launching rockets here. You know, <laughs> just keep it nice and simple. And if there's something that's already there that's done your work for you, use it." Yeah, and and it's nice that you know if. If you want everything that's in the internet template, except maybe you don't want the login system, just mm -hmm. delete it, right? So you can, but it does exactly. get you started. It gets all yep. that grunt work out of the way of saying like, well, I guess I want my page to have some CSS. You know? Exactly, <laughs> and that's that's actually a, a huge point to keep in mind with uh, with MVC. That if I bring in my Solution Explorer here and I open up my controllers and I open up my um, views here, and I'm just going to focus in on the account parts that, uh, that John mentioned, is you'll notice everything is right out there in the open. That there's our account controller, there's our account models, and then there is all of the views to go along with that. Mm -hmm. So if this gets you, say, 80% of the way there, but there's a couple little things that you need to change that maybe you need to add in um, an email confirmation to go along with this, it's all right there out in front of you. Right. So it's not doing something behind the scenes where you don't have the ability to customize it. It's all right there. There. So you can um, add, remove, rip things out, put things in as needed. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Now let's focus back in on our uh, models here. And you'll notice just like we've got folders for our controllers and we've got <clears throat> folders for our uh, models uh, or for our views, you'll notice that we've got a folder for our models. One of the interesting things is that our models 
can actually be anywhere. So mm -hmm. if you already have your business logic built, you've got the DLL already there, and all you're looking for is a brand new web facade for this, you can go ahead and just make the reference and, and build everything up that just because there's a folder there does not mean that your models have to go inside of there. If you're going to be calling web services, that's fine. You can call web services. There yeah. are no requirements that the model must be inside of this project. So the only one of all the things we've talked about so far, controllers, views, models, that really kind of you do want to keep it in that one place or have a good reason not to is views. Views, it does look for views in specific places. Yep. Uh, controllers and models you could put anywhere, but I'd recommend don't. I'd recommend right. leave them there because for, it's easier. And Absolutely. I can look at your code and I know where your models are. You exactly. Know? I mean, that's, yep. that's exactly. a great convention there. Yep, exactly. Okay, so let me go ahead and add in a brand new model here. So I'm just going to right click and add class. And let's go ahead and call this a uh, session here. Now, what I'm going to do with the uh, session is, again, nothing special. And that's sort of the whole theme is there's nothing special. So it's just simply going to be public um, int32 and let's say session ID. And let's throw in a, uh, a get and a set there. Uh, let's go ahead and give this a uh, title. And again, a get and a set. And let's throw in a, um, uh, an abstract for the session. And let's go ahead and say get and set. And uh, last but not least, uh, let's go ahead and give this a speaker. And let's say public um, speaker. And this is, I, I always love this little bit of functionality, just the control dot, and hey, yeah. I need a speaker class. <laughs> just go create this for me, I'll get back to it later. So just right there on the fly, control dot, hit enter, and it's already created my, uh, my speaker class. You can see that uh, right up there in the upper right hand corner. It's the little things in life that make yeah, me happy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know? Um, and let's say speaker, and uh, let's do a uh, get and a set. Um, now, you're going to notice I'm going to mark the speaker as virtual. Um, I'm doing that just because I know where I'm going with a later demo. More on that in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, on the abstract, uh, let's go ahead and flag that as uh, required. Again, control dot to bring in our uh, reference. I also want to point out, like John mentioned there, the uh, data annotation. So again, this is not something that's specific to MVC. Right. All right. So let's go ahead and mark that as uh, required. Let's go ahead and uh, mark that uh, data type. And let's say data type. And let's go with uh, multi-line text there. OK. And you know what? Let me mark the title as required. Perfect. Let's go ahead and come on over here to our speaker. And let's go ahead and say public um, int32 speaker ID, get set. Let's go ahead and say required. Oops, there we go. Let's go ahead. You know, while you're typing that, yeah, can I please. answer one question that was yeah. on the chat? So one person asked, what's the point of, of using a display attribute as opposed to just typing that into the view? Right? That's a fantastic question. It's a great question. So the reason you would do that, there's two reasons, I think. One is that now that's used in any, any kind of validation or anywhere else. MVC is now able to say, oh, I know the name of this. And that, that display, display name can have spaces in it, can have punctuation, all kinds of stuff. So, um, so that's nice because your validation can now say, your you know, user first name is not shown, as opposed to whatever the, the actual just name is. If you hard code that into your HTML, you, can't, it, you have to go and change all that. It's hard coded, right? Exactly. So, so those are really the two things, is one, validation, and two is, instead of hard coding it, it lives with your model. And now if you have, you may have 20 different views in your, in your site that all use that same model. You update it in one place in that model, and it reflects all throughout the site. Absolutely. So that, that's really that. That reason. Good question. Thank yeah, you. very good question. Just centralize everything. Um, mm -hmm. And there's actually, right along those lines, there's two little things that I want to um, highlight here. Um, number one is backup on, uh, on required that let's say that I want to put in a custom error message um, for my required. And so I could go ahead and type in um, speaker is uh, required. And you'll notice that I'm just 
changing um, the display here. Let me mm -hmm. say error message. There we go. Um, you'll notice that I'm changing the display for the name to say speaker. So it'll yeah. say speaker as, as the label. So I want to say in my error message, speaker is required. So that's a key thing. If you didn't follow that, the, the, the name, it's just name is the property name, but you yep. called it speaker. So you can override it. You can put it in a different language, all that stuff. Exactly, exactly. Now, on the error message, um, you'll notice that I hard-coded in, speaker is required. Mm -hmm. So Einstein sort of once said, don't memorize anything you can look up. Right. My corollary to that is don't hard code anything that you can look up. Mm -hmm. So if uh, maybe later on we decided that we wanted to change this to maybe be, say, speaker name like that, right. well now our error message is hard coded to say speaker is required. Yep. So we could go in and just use the typical string format, curly zero curly, and now it's just going to grab whatever the display is and put that into there. So that way we're always looking it up. Now, one of the other questions that frequently comes up at this point is, what happens if this class was generated? Like, let's say that we're doing you know, uh, some link to SQL, or we're doing database first entity framework, where we're just letting it generate everything for us. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you're going to have your partial classes. That's and exactly so right. yep. what you can do is create another class down below. And I'm going to do this real quickly here. Let's say public class um, speaker uh, metadata. Metadata, which is spelled like that. And then inside of here, just put in all that annotation. So let's just go ahead and say, um, I'm just going to make it real easy on myself required. Boom. And then we'll just say public um, object name like that. And then, so I put that off into a separate class. Right. Because, of course, I can't modify what Visual Studio has created. And then in my partial class, which would look like this, I can say, hey, you know what? For all that metadata, go look up type of speaker metadata. Go look down below for the metadata. Yeah. So, so just to echo what yeah, you said. Yeah. So that is, if if you, the easiest way, if you're creating the models, you write your properties and you put your annotations yes, on them. Yes, absolutely. If somebody else is creating that, maybe those models are coming out of a DLL that someone in a different team wrote, mm -hmm. or coming from a web service or whatever, and you don't have access to that. Or if it's generated, like you said, by Visual Studio, this is called a buddy class here that I've heard that call. And, yep. and that's where you can just throw your metadata, and then you point your metadata class, you point the two together. Yep, right? exactly. So. That's exactly it. All right. In any event, let's uh, control Z or control Z um, yeah. the whole way back here. There we go. OK. Bring everything back. And let's go ahead and do it like that. All right. So there's our, our model at the moment. Uh, we still need to go back and uh, do our data. I am seeing we've, we've run just a, a scotch over 50 minutes. Yep. Something tells me we'll probably do that a couple times today. <laughs> um, so what do you say we uh, take 10? Um, yep. It's kind of a, a perfect breaking point. We'll come on back, and then we'll take a look at uh, some, uh, some database work. And, and just to remind you, you know, we had a few people on chat, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are thinking, wow, this is a lot of information. What we what we did here is this first session. We we wanted you to see MVC, mm -hmm. create a project, uh, put something on the screen right away. You didn't need to understand all that really. We just wanted to show we have a controller and it's returning stuff to the screen. Mm -hmm. The model we want to show you it's just a class with properties and you can put attributes on it if you want. That's exactly so, it. So we've got all day to dig into this. You know, yep. don't worry. The the point here is we're kind of tearing into the things in detail. We yep. learned about models; they're just classes. Yeah, that's it. Easy enough. Just classes. <laughs> so, uh, so we've been talking. We did our overview. We've been yep. talking about models a little bit. Uh, if we can cut to my slide real quick, I just want to show the quick "you are here" ma map. Uh, so remember, where uh, if if things are going fast and you're getting a little worried, I want to bring it back basic, yep. right? Yep. So we've got the request coming in. It's going to a controller. The controller looks up a model, and that's where we at. Exactly. So the controller, and we're going to dig into controllers in a lot more detail in just a minute. Yep. But but the point is, the simple little model that the controller passes to the view, that's what we're looking at there. So we're looking at it's a simple class with properties and attributes if you want them. Exactly. Right. And that's and and so we're basically we're right at that do stuff portion. Yeah. That this is this is the model. This is what's going to be doing the stuff. Uh, so if we kick back over to my Visual Studio again. Um, that what I want to do here um, real quickly is I'm just going to get rid of all of the annotations that I have on here. And let's just go back to, again, to, to belabor the point, the very 
simple thing that we keep saying over and over again, which is it's a class. Mm -hmm. That's all that our model is. So if you look at this, this is sort of C Sharp 101 here, that it's public class. We've created a couple of properties. The, the only real sort of fancy thing that we've done is we've done the automatic properties, which is one of my favorite little features. Again, yeah. simple things in life make me happy. <laughs> um, but that's it. That the, There's nothing overly fancy about this class. Um, this is a model. Even without the attributes, this is still a model. By adding in the attributes, it gives us the ability to, again, help MVC help us. So if we want to mark something as required, if we want to, instead of spelling out email address to our users, if we want to go in and just simply say um, that we want to show email instead, then we can go in and do that. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just a class. That's all that our model is. This could be calling web services. This could be using a uh, database. This could be doing whatever it is that we need to do. It's just our normal classes behind the scenes. So that you mentioned the database. That sounds like mm -hmm. a good segue there. That, that actually sounds like a, uh, a perfect segue. Let's um, kick on over to our uh, next little section talking about our, uh, our databases. Now, what we want to do is we want to get something that's going to work uh, relatively easy for all of our demos uh, that's going to use a uh, database. So we're going to do code first uh, entity framework here. And what you're going to notice with the entity framework, again, this is the, um, I don't want to use the word API, but this is the, um, uh, the implementation behind the scenes that's going to allow us to do our object relational mapping. So rather than us going in and dynamically building up our SQL statements and having to modify data directly, hey, let's just work with objects instead. Right. <coughs> one, one thing that's important here is that you can use Entity Framework. Yep. Entity Framework is a great uh, object relational mapper. It's a way of getting data and mapping them into classes. Yep. If you don't like Entity Framework, maybe you want to use N Hibernate or whatever else, knock yourself out, right? Exactly, exactly. Again, you know, we've said it before and we're going to say it again. It's nothing but a class. So if yeah. you are using N Hibernate, if you are using um, Link to SQL, if you are using whatever it is, um, you, have, uh, you have that capability. Mm -hmm. All right, so again, with um, uh, the Entity Framework, you have kind of three ways that you can go in and do this. Uh, you could start with the database and just let Visual Studio generate the classes for you. Uh, you could uh, go with the model and uh, do that through the designer, or you could use code first, and that's exactly what we want to do here, is we want to utilize code first. Now, if I kick back over to Visual Studio here, one of the things that you're going to notice is I've sort of been cheating a little bit. Um, that I've, I've snuck in a couple of things uh, already for code first. That you'll notice for starters here that I said speaker ID. And mm -hmm. let's again go back and, and bring up the magic word, which is convention. Right. That you'll notice the name of the class here is speaker. You'll notice that there's a property here called speaker ID. John, what do you think speaker ID is going to be? Now, I'm just going to make a wild guess. Go ahead. I'm going to call it the primary key. Hey, hey wouldn't you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you know it, we know it, and Code First knows it. So uh, it's going to look at that, and it's automatically going to mark our speaker ID as the primary key. So this is Entity Framework doing that. Yep. And this is Code First Entity Framework. Code doing First that. Entity Framework, and this is a uh, it's a convention, mm -hmm. and the two that work are speaker ID or ID, just ID by itself. Yep. And you can change those conventions if you want. Let's exactly. say it needs to be PK underscore blah, blah, blah. You can write the, <laughs> I know <laughs> we both shudder. I, I, yeah, those yeah, are shivered at that. But, but you can do that. If you have your own conventions, that you can create your own conventions in code. Yep. You can say, this is how I want you to find. But by default, those default conventions are the ID or the class name ID. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. The other thing that you're going to notice um, that I snuck in here, let's use uh, orange just for a slightly different uh, color scheme here, um, is virtual. That one of the things that's going to happen automatically is a uh, lazy loading. So it's not going to get a speaker's session unless I actually touch that property. But in order to allow for that to happen behind the scenes, we do need to flag that as virtual. So that way it can load that up properly. 
And by the way, just right along those same lines, again, as John mentioned earlier, if there's anything that you don't like, you always have the opportunity to change that. So you can go in and specify, hey, if you go get a speaker, automatically load up their session. So that way, if lazy loading isn't going to be appropriate for you, you don't have to use lazy loading. So the overall kind of, I don't know, thinking behind just about anything in, a, in MVC is simple conventions that just work Yes. But you can change them. Yep. Right? So we start with, you know, all those things. How we find the view or, you know, using names that match probably means they go together or finding the primary key or things like that. Uh, simple conventions that should just work, but if you don't like them, you can write your own. That's exactly. the idea. Yep. That's, that's, that's a perfect way to explain it. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a brand new context here. I'm going to call this my conference uh, context. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with any form of uh, LINK, and again, LINK stands for Language Integrated Query, picking up the N from integrated, so that way we don't have to call it LIC, which I think is kind of nice. Right. Uh, and uh, what LINK allows us to do is to create our queries in, say, C Sharp or in VB and have that translated for something behind the scenes. Well, what we need is we need a go-between. We need something in between our environment and the back end to allow for those queries to be translated and given something that, that we can work with. And that's what our context here is going to do for us. This is going to act as our, our go-between. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to build this up uh, manually, and you're going to notice that I'm going to inherit from context, whoops, uh, sorry, DB context. There we go. And once again, using that control dot, let's just pull in the system data entity. And again, our context is going to be our go-between. So when I say, hey, I want this particular speaker, I'm going to go into my context. When I say, hey, I want this particular session, I go into my context. So I need to create some properties on this context that will allow me to go access that information. So let me go ahead and create my couple little properties here. So we'll say DB set, and this is going to be our session, and let's call it sessions. I'm very creative in my naming, <laughs> and public DB set, and let's say speaker. And let's say speakers. So those DB sets, yeah. those are basically data aware collection classes, right? Yes. So it's yep. you can iterate through them. You can, I mean, it's just it's a uh, it's like a collection of whatever mm -hmm. of speakers or sessions, but they're data aware. So they do that all that magical data, you know, lazy loading and all that kind of thing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. We, we had a few questions come in and. Yeah. Um, uh, questions on why the virtual was there again. Do you want to get into that in more detail now or later? Um, well, let's go ahead and touch on it now if you want to okay. go ahead and, and feel that. Yeah, sure. So the idea there, the virtual is kind of like a foreign key. So you're saying yep. that this, uh, you know, my I think it was a session has speaker, right? Sure. Or, and so this is a way of telling Entity Framework, this is virtual and it allows that lazy loading. Yep. And it, so it allows kind of the, the foreign key and the lazy loading between the two. Exactly. That's it. That that virtual, just like you said, is that's what's going to enable that out of the box lazy loading for us. OK. Yep. All right. So back over here, uh, we've got our uh, little context. Now, we want to be able to start testing things. And in order to start testing things, we're going to want some data. We're going to want a database to play around with. And this is where an initializer comes into play. So I'm going to create another little class here. And this is going to be my conference context initializer. And this is going to be my drop create database always for my conference context. OK. Now, sort of like the name implies there, hey, John, again, yes. what do you think that's going to do? <clears throat> I'm going to guess this is going to always drop and create something. There I'm drawing you a go. blank at the last thing. Maybe a database. Maybe a database. Okay. Maybe a database. So just like it says here, this is going to delete everything and start all over. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that... That seems like not something you want to do in production. No, <laughs> okay. no. <laughs> Safety tip from us to right, you. Right, right. Putting this in production, not a good idea. So, so with this seed, this is great for as you're testing, yep. it's going to add some... Add some um, Add some sample data that you can work with and all that kind of stuff. Yep. And the way you've got it set is very easy for uh, development. You can say, um, you know, I'm going to play around here. I'm going to add a property. I'm going to do this and that. And it always drops and recreates a data database for you. 
Um, but it's obviously not something, once you're in production, that's a bad idea. And we'll be talking, we had some questions on chat, we'll be talking about this later. That's where code first migrations come in. Migrations are a way to, in code, define what happens over time, how your model and your database change over time and, and controlling that in a systematic way. Exactly. So again, you know, uh, what we're wanting to do with this little initializer is to make sure that we've got some data to play with and something that's going to be um, a, a consistent testing environment. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you kick back over here, what you're going to notice uh, of a uh, spaghetti lever. Um, <laughs> there we go. And uh, what I'm doing here is I'm actually creating um, a brand new session that's going to be added in. You'll notice the title. You'll notice the, uh, the abstract. And then I'm also going to create our little speaker here. And let's say speaker equals context uh, speakers add. And let's say new speaker and... Now, while you're yeah, typing this, please. let me answer a question that came in. So somebody uh, is, is kind of... Uh, worried that, wait, I think I missed something. When did you create the database? So this is a good, good yes. time to remind. Uh, there are a few different ways of using Entity Framework. There's Entity Framework data first, model first, or code first. So with data first, you have an existing database. And this is the case in a lot of applications. And then you can, you can map the two together. Um, in uh, model first, this is where you go and you drag and drop and design kind of your model and then that's going to generate things. What we're doing is entity framework code first. So what code first is, is exactly as the name implies. We're writing code and that code is going to um, define, that code's going to say what the models are. It's going to, as we indicated, hint what the primary key is. It's going to say what the data types are. And then entity framework is smart enough to look at that and say, I can figure out a database from this. I can say, I'm looking at this, and I think you need a session table, and you need a speaker table. And because of that virtual, there's a foreign key. So it creates the database when we run the application. So that right now, that database does not exist until you run the app. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, if we kick back over to, uh, to the code, I've now, while uh, uh, John was uh, answering a couple of questions, kind of finished it all out. And this is going to be our very basic little initializer for, for right now. Uh, and what you're going to notice is that on the fly, I'm going to add in a brand new session. Now, one of the very cool things about the add method, sort of like the name implies, is this is going to create a brand new, in our case, session. And I'm going to use the initializer to set up my title and my abstract right there. But you'll also notice that add will return the object that we just created back. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about our sessions is that our sessions need a speaker, which is a full object. It's not just simply text. Yep. So I can create this right here by just calling add. And two things will happen. Number one is it will give me the speaker back. But also number two is that when I call save changes, it's smart enough to know, hey, if we have a session, we need a speaker for that first. Right. So it will create the speaker and then create the session afterwards so that way we're not going to get any foreign key constraint errors or anything like that. Yeah. So getting all that grunt work out of the way. Right? Exactly. You write yep. the code and it makes the data happen. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. Cool. So there is our uh, little initializer. The last thing that I want to do with that is just inside of my application start is to say database dot set initializer for my conference context. And by the way, you'll notice that I keep using the control dot. That's just to add in all the namespaces. So that way I'm not having to constantly go back up to the top and say using and using. So I'm just adding in the namespaces as I, uh, as I go here. Now, what this is doing for me is this is going to keep an eye on my conference context for me. Mm -hmm. And the moment that I go to use this for the first time, it's going to then run the initializer. So it will then, behind the scenes, just like John mentioned earlier, set up the database for me. And it will also go ahead and create my little session and create my, my speaker. Yep. So this, what we're showing here is this is a feature of Entity Framework Code First. Yep. It makes it easy to, as you're developing, get data into your database, work with your models, refine your models. Maybe you say, as you start running, you say, wait a minute, I need this and I need that. And you can start playing with your models and changing them around. 
easily. So it kind of reduces that cycle time. Yep. And yeah. this this is a, it's a useful development feature. But when you're in mm -hmm. production, you're not going to be doing y right. using these database initializers. So yeah. Much. That one of the big things to mention here is you'll notice. We are going to take a couple of shortcuts for demo purposes, um, just because going in and, and, and setting all of this up properly from scratch would take the rest of the week. That's an over-exaggeration, but it would take a lot longer than, than we really want it to. So we are going to sort of simplify things. So when it comes to our little initializer, we can set it up so that it's only called when it's on dev or when it's on testing yeah. rather than uh, always having a call. So yes, I'm throwing it into the application start right here. Again, this is just for our demo purposes. Yep. We are going to take a couple little shortcuts here just to try and keep things rolling. Awesome. So let's go ahead and do a build, just to make sure everything builds. And I think we've got the bulk of our models. Just one last little slide to, uh, to highlight here. And this goes back to what I mentioned just a moment ago, which is we're taking a couple of shortcuts here. We are not going to go in and properly set everything up that you are going to notice in our, in our actions. We're going to go straight into our data context. Mm -hmm. What really should happen is we really should set this up to go through some form of a repository, some form of a service to help simplify things. So really our controller, and I always like to simplify it, that our controller should do uh, three basic things in every action. Number one, validate the input. Number two, take the input, pass that back to the model. And then number three is take the response and send it out the door. So everything should be done inside the model. So all of our queries and everything else should be done inside the model. So that way, as things change, we don't have to run back into our actions and update it. So if we decide later on, hey, rather than always go into the database, let's set up something with caching, we could just go in and update our repository to do that. So if we kick back over to the slide, what I want you to notice is that our repository just acts as a go-between. So rather than calling directly into our database or rather than calling directly into our, our DB context, let's go to the repository, let the repository do all the work. Yeah, so that's a really key thing. You know, people people want to say, where does my code go? It's not the view, right? The view is supposed to be lightweight mm -hmm. HTML. And the model is really pretty lightweight in terms of it holds data. Yep. Um, so then people say, oh, I'll put all my code in my controller. And the idea is you don't really want long controller actions either. You want those to be very lightweight. So where does the code go? And that's where you say, well, I could use a service potentially, or in yep. this case, a, a repository. But you want to separate those kind of common concerns put those somewhere else. So you could have a, you know, if, if you've got a lot of services happening, you put, I make a services folder and use a class there. Yep. Or here, a repository is just, it's it's nothing complex. It's a, it's an in-between thing that you call into. So a lot of times, say for instance, your uh, conference repository, or say your, your speakers repository, sure. could have a get speakers method and an yep. update speakers and that kind of thing. And like you're saying, then you can replace that later. You can test it. It's very easy yes. to uh, mock that out for testing. So then you can swap things in. You could also, in development, you could say, just get things you know, from this you know, XML file or whatever, or from mm -hmm. this lightweight testing thing. But in production, hit the production database. So that, that repository yeah. is just that kind of separation layer. We're not digging into that in this, in this, but we're explaining that it is an important step for professional development to use that. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. Is there anything else on models? Uh, no, did, no. So uh, should we? I think let's roll on in and start taking a look at uh, at the some controllers. controllers. And that's where the kind of this fits together well. We've defined something that holds data, but it's not really doing anything fun for us yet. Exactly. So that's yeah. where we need a controller to do the stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> let's let's have some fun with this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's.